Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a panel discussion hosted by the Conservation and Adaptation Resources Toolbox, or CART for short. My name is Ariel Liji, and I'm CART's Grassland Community Practice Coordinator. I sit in the universe, at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Carly Jewell from Fish and Wildlife Service Science Applications is here with me today and will help facilitate this webinar. For those of you who are new to CART, CART supports an issue-based instead of geography-based conservation by facilitating peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange through case studies, webinars, and workshops. These activities support the development of communities of practice focused on grassland restoration, non-native aquatic species, aquatic restoration, drought, climate adaptation, and fire. Today, we're going to be hearing from Joel Biederman and Martha Sample, followed by a panel discussion and Q&A where presenters will ask que answer questions for the, from the audience and propose questions for discussion for webinar participants. Once again, we encourage you to please write any questions directly in the chat. We'll keep track of these questions for the panelists to answer after the presentations. And without further ado, I will introduce the speakers. Um, Joel Biederman is a research hydrologist with the USDA ARS Southwest Watershed Research Center. He researches the impacts of climate and land use change on watershed services and develops new tools for sustainable watershed management. His work leverages results from diverse sites to address questions about the interactions of ecosystems and hydrology, drought, fire, and logging, and snow hydrology from regional to global scales. Today, Joe will be talking about the Rainfall Manipulation Experiment, or RainMan SR, a three-year field experiment in a semi-arid grassland where researchers measured the responses of plants and soil to different drought durations and rainfall magnitudes. Um, after Joel, we're going to be hearing from Martha Sample, who is a research coordinator for the Center for Adaptable Western Landscapes at Northern Arizona University. Martha's many interests fall under the umbrella of conservation planning and management to address global change. Currently, her work focuses on effective ecological monitoring, evaluating outcomes of ecological restoration, and developing climate adaptation strategies for land managers in the Southwest. Today, Martha will be discussing the climate adaptation strategies for arid grasslands that <clears throat> researchers at the Center for Adaptable Western Landscapes at Northern Arizona University, developed in partnership with a collaborative group of scientists, managers, and adaptation specialists. Um, Joel, I'll pass it to you. You can start sharing your screen and jump right in when you're ready. All right. Hey, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for uh, joining today. Uh, this is my, my first uh, formal interaction with CART, and I want to thank Arielle for reaching out. Um, and I'm excited to, to uh, hear feedback from you all on, on the presentation I have and also uh, to see Martha's. So as Arielle mentioned, I'm a research hydrologist. Uh, I've been slowly backing into uh, rangeland and dryland ecology uh, since I was employed by the USDA about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, focus on a rainfall manipulation uh, experimental facility um, that, uh, that we built with colleagues at the University of Arizona and, and some other collaborators regionally uh, in the Santa Rita Experimental Range. Uh, some of you will be familiar with that, uh, south of Tucson, about halfway uh, to the Sonora border. Uh, you see a, a UAV shot of it here. Uh, it's a great place to work from a scenic standpoint. Um, but it's also uh, pretty hot work. We're doing uh, midday experiments throughout most of the monsoon season. Uh, I see Aaron Peretz is here. Uh, he's moved on to a different position, uh, but he spent all last summer working out here, uh, uh, gathering some of the data that I'm going to present today from the, the comfort of my air conditioning. Uh, so the main focus of Rainman SR is to repackage rainfall, the naturally occurring rainfall, and without changing its amount, uh, change the timing of how it's applied on the landscape. Uh, the reason we're doing this is because observations uh, over the last 50 years that have been assembled by uh, people in our group uh, and others have shown that this is, uh, this is the trend we've seen since the 1970s across much of the Southwest. So we capture that rainfall, we store it in underground tanks, and then we apply it by hand uh, back to our experimental plots uh, in different timings without changing its total amount. Um, because we're going to reserve questions for the end here, I did number my slides in the lower right uh, in case you have a question about a particular slide that you want to note as we go along. 
So I'll begin with why did we build Rain Man? There are other rainfall manipulation uh, uh, facilities, many, many dozens worldwide, including several dozen uh, in, in the Western United States. But the first distinction is the one I mentioned earlier is that we're blocking all of the natural rainfall. Um, most rainfall manipulation facilities uh, use a perforated roof or partial shelter to reduce a fraction of the natural rainfall, um, but we're doing something different that allows us to alter the timing. Uh, another reason is our unique situation in the Sonoran Desert, where we have two growing seasons driven by our wet uh, winter season, indicated here with mean monthly rainfall in the upper left panel, uh, and then our main summer growing season, and then that hot dry period in between that we're going through right now. Uh, this is the a key figure in the lower left here from a paper published in 2021 uh, by our postdoc Feng Wei Zhang, uh, who did a really, really labor intensive analysis where she gathered all the daily precipitation data available for about 350 locations across the Western United States uh, since the early 1970s. And she looked at different statistics of the timing of that rainfall. Many people have focused on the amount, but when she looked at the timing, uh, a key result she found is that the longest dry interval occurring in a given year uh, between subsequent rainfall events is getting longer in all the places that are indicated in red dots and shorter in the places indicated in blue dots, mainly the, the upper plains here. You can see that pretty much all of uh, the Western United States, the Southwest, uh, we've seen longer dry intervals. Uh, the amount of summer rainfall doesn't show a clear trend. Uh, so the conclusion here is that we're getting fewer but larger storms with longer rain, uh, longer dry intervals. We're also, of course, getting less winter precipitation. Uh, that's not something we're focusing on in this first experiment, but, but in a future experiment. Um, and so uh, a final reason for Rain Man is that we're using it as a test bed for remote sensing. Uh, many of the tools, probably some that you use like NDVI or Modus products for productivity or, or, or things like that, or ET, um, are often performing much less well in drylands uh, than the more humid regions where those products uh, were developed. Um, so our ability to use uh, freely available spaceborne data to predict or make assessments or things like stocking rates uh, or, or grazing productivity uh, are really limited in dry lands compared to other parts of the world. So here's an overview of some of the key features of Rain Man. I'll start with the map on the left. We're about an hour's drive south of Tucson at the foot of the Santa Rita Range, as you saw in that opening photograph. Uh, this is in a Sonoran Desert grassland. It's a mix of annual uh, and perennial bunch grasses. Uh, the primary uh, native bunch grass out there is Arizona cottontop. And then we have, of course, some encroaching uh, layman's love grass. Uh, and then we have a mix of many different uh, annual and perennial forbs. Uh, in, the, in the panel on the left, you can see a schematic made from a UAV image and then, and then digitized, showing the layout of our exclosure. It's five acres. Uh, we have uh, five rainout shelters, uh, each over 12 plots. So in total, we have 60 experimental plots. Uh, I'll show that we have four different treatments. So we have a sample, a replicate size of 15 of each treatment. Um, and each one is replicated three times in each of these five houses. It's important to note that even though this is a mesquite savanna, we deliberately located these houses in the intercanopy space between mesquites made sure there were no live mesquites and also no obvious dead mesquites leaving a big big ball of, of woody mass uh, in the plot. So we're trying to focus for this first experiment at least on grassland. In the middle here, you can see what one of the houses looks like. It's got 100% uh, plastic over the top blocking all the natural rainfall. It's much larger than the plots to make sure that even on a, on a windy monsoon event, we don't have much rain coming in from the sides. But we did leave the sides open uh, to allow maximal airflow so that we don't accumulate a lot of heat under here. Uh, and then you can see the 12 plots underneath with some instrumentation. A lot of rodents out here, so we had to, to fence these uh, three feet high of mesh, and then that mesh is also buried two feet below the ground against burrowing. Uh, Aaron was actually responsible for some of the rodent control for, for those that made, made it through, um, and we haven't figured out how to replace him yet. Nobody wants that job. And then uh, in the lower right, we see an example of one plot. A key feature here to note is that this metal flashing you see around the edge, that actually, that and, and two layers of black plastic extend uh, one meter deep 
in uh, below the soil. So we trenched around every one of these 60 plots a meter deep and then hydraulically isolated it. Uh, that metal flashing is also designed to, to prevent root uh, incursion from the nearby mesquites looking, looking for our water and, and potentially screwing up the results. A couple of other things you see here in this example plot, uh, a little soil collar, that's just a piece of PVC hammered into the soil. Uh, we can drop an instrument on top of that and measure the efflux of carbon dioxide. We see a soil moisture probe. There are several others buried at greater depth. Uh, and then here you see a, a root imaging tube. So that's a transparent tube, 50 centimeters deep. And we drop a camera down there uh, that, that can look all around and, and uh, assess root area uh, through a fairly time intensive process. A um, couple of site characteristics, we get about 375 millimeters of annual precip and a mean annual temperature 18 degrees. So here's my colleague Bill Smith at the University of Arizona. He's the co-PI on Rain Man, uh, removing uh, dirt from some of that trenching. We, we did the trenching with a trenching machine. We put plywood on top of the ecosystem to protect it. We did it during May, during the, the pre-monsoon dry down when the grasses were, were dormant and all the annuals were pretty much dead. Uh, for minimal disturbance and then we took the plywood off when we were done and it rained in July and, and we were right back in business ecologically. Um, some, some of the automated and ongoing measurements at the site include soil water content, water potential which measures uh, how much suction a root would have to apply to extract water from the soil. It's more difficult in clay soils but it's fairly easy here in our sandy loam soil. Uh, we have temperature sensors in the soil, uh, and then we have phenocams above each plot, so we're measuring the greenness. Uh, we go out with a team of about eight people weekly, and we measure uh, gas exchange, so that's water vapor coming off the plots, out of the plants, and out of the soil, and then uptake of CO2 by the plants, release of CO2 from the soil, uh, and then we take thermal imagery, which has sh uh, shown some really interesting results with regard to evaporation. Uh, every two weeks, we take leaf area index, and then we use that camera uh, down in the root profile um, to get uh, development of roots underground. And then monthly, we count all the plants in every plot. It takes a team of people, about eight people, about four days to count all the plants and assess uh, cover by functional type. So the first experiment that I'll focus on today, we've been running since the beginning of 2020. So we've just about to begin our fourth summer of that the temporal repackaging of summer rain. And this schematic uh, illustrates uh, what that looks like. We, we have at one extreme S1, that stands for summer repackaging one, uh, is, is many small storms. That's actually more storms and smaller than the historical average. S2 uh, is the historical average. That's a storm of about half an inch or, or about a third of an inch once a week. Um, that's the historical norm at this site, according to a local rain gauge. And then S3 gets watered every two weeks, and S4 gets a big dump every three weeks. But they all add up to 205 millimeters throughout the course of the monsoon. So we're holding the amount constant. And the three broad questions we're asking below here are, which type of plants will be successful? We hypothesize that few large storms will, advance, uh, will be advantageous for the deeper uh, perennial plants because they're able to access that deeper water, and they're not as sensitive to the soil surface drying out. In S4, the soil surface dries out for several weeks between watering events, but the deep soil stays wetter. Question two, what are the consequences for carbon dioxide uptake? Uh, and this is, this is of interest both from a kind of global carbon cycling and climate change feedback standpoint, and also because the amount of carbon dioxide is a good indicator of productivity for, for forage and grazing. Uh, water evaporation, of course, is important for obvious reasons, and then surface temperature impacts. And then third, uh, what are the proximal remote sensing methods that capture the ecosystem structure, function, and productivity? So we're out there with large teams making a lot of manual, labor-intensive, and sweaty measurements. Uh, but in the, mean, in the meantime, our colleagues group has uh, different kinds of cameras and sensors seeing, could we do this remotely without visiting a site? Could we do it from a drone? Could we do it from an airplane? And eventually, what are the sensors uh, that we should use on the future uh, uh, spaceborne missions? So I'll move into some of the key results now. Uh, one of the most uh, common metrics for an experiment of this type that's it's a broad interest for scientific and applied uh, purposes is the perennial bunch grass annual net primary productivity. Um, that's the, the key thing functionally for uh, grazing. And what we found as we move from the, the S1, the many small events are indicated in blue here in all the slides, 
And then the S4 are at the other end, that's the few large, those are indicated in the orange, um, is that the per plant biomass increased by about 40, 50% as we went to fewer, larger events. But we actually had fewer plants survive for reasons we don't quite understand. So when we looked across the whole plot level, larger plants, but fewer of them at the plot level, uh, there was no change in overall biomass. Next, we'll move to look at the key variable that I think uh, mediates all these ecological responses, uh, which is soil moisture. Uh, and many times an experiment like this will measure soil moisture um, at one depth. And we think one of the key things to do here as we're trying to understand the response of different types of plants uh, to this climate change is to measure profiles of soil moisture. So what we're looking at here is a time course through, this, through the summer of 2020, uh, beginning at about uh, late May, which was the last time, or sorry, early May, the last time we irrigated in the spring. And then we let the ecosystem get completely dry through June. And then with, with July, we, we uh, initiated a, an artificial monsoon and began irrigating. And then all these wiggles you're seeing, that's the course of the monsoon 2020. Blue is the top 10 centimeters of the soil. That's the water content there. Uh, orange is the 25 centimeter depth, so about 10 inches. Uh, and, then, and then the yellow is 75 centimeters, so about 30 inches down. And I'm only showing uh, for simplicity here, the extremes. The top is the S1, the, the small amount of rain of twice a week. And then the bottom panel is S4, the, the huge amount of rain every three weeks. And so let's start here with the top and the shallow soil in blue. Um, every, every plot, no matter what treatment it was assigned, got a significant dose of rainfall, about uh, an inch and a half at the beginning of the monsoon because we had let things get extremely dry and we, 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 we figured that that's what was necessary to kick off biological activity. So we see that initial pulse. And then all these little wiggles, of course, are the twice a week little spitting events, five millimeters, six millimeters, eight millimeters, and they wet the surface, but gradually uh, it dries down, it dries down, and it falls below this, what turns out to be a key value for this ecosystem of about 5% soil moisture. We've learned through several years of experience that below 5% moisture, uh, the plants really begin to, to shut down. And so after uh, August, um, the moisture never even rises above 5%, even with these little irrigation events. And then at deeper depths in orange and yellow, no response. Five to seven millimeters of water was never enough to reach that deeper rooting zone. Then we move down to the other extreme, the fewest largest events. So that's the, the extremity of the, the future climate change scenario. In the shallow soil in blue, the top 10 centimeters, it gets good and wet each of the four times that it rained. Uh, and it takes a few days to dry down below that 5% level. But then notice that it's about two weeks of time pass when this blue line is below the 5% level. So the near surface is inhospitable for those shallow rooted annuals. So what we see a lot of times in these S4 plots is if there's seed available, annuals will germinate, things turn up nice and green, there's lots of photosynthesis for about a week or two, and then those plants perish because the surface dries out. The flip side here though, is that if we look at the orange trace in the 25 centimeter depth, um, the first rainfall doesn't really get down there, but the second rainfall, third rainfall, and the fourth rainfall are adding moisture faster than it's getting depleted. So at 25 centimeters in this few large treatment, the soil stays wet for several months uh, beginning in about early August. So that's a key difference between these uh, two, two treatment extremes. And so to describe that, uh, one of our colleagues, a uh, close collaborator in Rain Man, Dan Potts, has updated uh, Alan Knapp's 2008 uh, bucket model for soil moisture for a, two, a proposed two-level uh, bucket model. So the top row here, we see shallow soil moisture. That's kind of the original buck mo bucket model from, from Alan Knapp's 2008 paper. And then we've added this deep soil moisture. And then on the left, we're comparing the, the many small events and this right column is the few large events. And so if we start in this upper left-hand panel in the shallow soil, the, the frequent small events are moving uh, across a drought uh, to this gray area in the middle. That's where plants are happy. We're moving across that drought threshold. So we have intermediate stress really frequently. Uh, if we move over to the right, 
uh, what I just talked about with the actual data is that we see a big spike into the happy zone, but then multiple days, uh, usually about two weeks, where there's a lot of stress in that shallow soil moisture. So this shallow soil environment with few large events is really inhospitable uh, unless a plant can go two weeks uh, of stress without, without serious consequences. And then in the deep soil, the frequent small events really never uh, wet the deep soil. So if you're a deep rooted plant, you're continually stressed under frequent small events. Uh, but most of the time you're in the happy zone under the infrequent large events, which get the wa water in larger amounts deeper where it's kind of stored uh, with less subjectivity to evaporation. So one of the consequences of that difference in soil moisture is a change in the timing of peak productivity. So this may be of interest if you're thinking from a, a grazing standpoint, when is peak productivity on, on this unit? Uh, or if you're wondering, should I look at a remote sensing image of my land uh, area of interest to determine the stocking rate for a future time? Uh, what time of year is peak productivity? We often assume it's something like September 1st. Uh, what we found here using tenting measure, measurements of carbon dioxide uptake, and these were also confirmed by uh, automated remote sensing uh, imagery, is that the few um, large events indicated here in orange had their peak productivity about a month later. So this is out here 60 days after the start of the monsoon, uh, out here in mid-September, whereas with the, the, the many small events, peak productivity uh, was in July uh, because those plants took off quickly, those annuals, uh, and then they perished uh, pretty rapidly, as I mentioned earlier. Mustafa Javadian, a, a recent um, uh, postdoc uh, here who's going to be joining Andrew Richardson's group, uh, I think this, this week uh, up at NAU, um, published, it, it has in review a really interesting paper on thermal data uh, that, that corroborate this understanding from the two-layer bucket model. Uh, what we see here is that the overall surface temperature as we move to the, to the future climate scenario with the few large events, the overall surface temperature is, per, is persistently cooler by about up to two degrees Celsius. The reason for that is that there's that persistent soil moisture at the greater depth, the deeper rooted plants are proliferating uh, in those plots, and they're able to constantly access that deep soil moisture and transpire it, uh, cooling the land surface on a more consistent basis. To follow up on that hypothesis, what, what we did is we drew polygons uh, around the imagery in our, in our uh, visible imagery, so we separated out some shallow rooted annuals from some deep rooted perennials. Then we overlaid that on the thermal imagery so that we could separately uh, look at the temperature trend of annual plants and perennial plants. And we found that with longer dry intervals, as we move from the blue to the orange, we're, we're going from the, through the longer dry intervals and larger storms, the annual plants got hotter. They were less able to access that deep water. They were often sitting in that shallow, dry soil for several weeks at a time. They got hotter and often they died. And then the deeper moisture and, and roots allowed the perennial plants to be cooler under that same climate change scenario. And something I thought was kind of interesting is that at the historical norm, the S2 manipulated control seemed to be a break-even point in temperature where annual plants and perennial plants had uniform access to water and, and maintain uh, the same temperature as each, as each other. We see this borne out in the root profile data. Uh, we see deeper roots in the S4. Uh, so this is what we're looking at here as we move to the right, more roots. As we move down, we're moving deeper into the soil from the gray line as the surface down to 50 centimeters depth. And as we, as we move down in S4, uh, we get more and more uh, roots as we go deeper. Whereas with the many small events or the historical norm, roots peak at about 15 centimeters depth and then they decline uh, as we get deeper. So this is substantiating uh, Mustafa's results and suggesting that those deeper rooted plants are really uh, accessing that deeper water. And then the final result I'll show here is that fewer larger rainfalls reduce the soil carbon dioxide efflux. So this is from those soil collars uh, where we're measuring CO2 that's being effectively decomposed from soil carbon or released by plant roots. And I note that the color, the color scheme is changed here, but uh, the S1s with the many small events uh, in purple, cumulatively over the course of the summer, they release the most carbon uh, and the S4s release the least carbon. 
Uh, this makes sense with our understanding of what drives soil respiration because litter and decomposition are often concentrated in the top few centimeters of soil. And if that soil is spending most of the summer dry, uh, the microbes that are often responsible for meeting, mediating that uh, can't be very effective. So to summarize uh, what we learned in these first three years of experiment one, if we have fewer and larger rainfalls without changing the amount, some of the key consequences are uh, increased per plant biomass, uh, but no change in the whole plot uh, biomass. Uh, the soil gets wet more deeply, resulting in deeper uh, root allocation. Um, it provided sustained water for deeper rooted perennials, which kept them cooler, and less water for shallow rooted annuals, and they got hotter. Uh, we delayed peak photosynthesis and productivity uh, by about a month. And this was driven uh, by the slower response of the perennials that were favored under this scenario. Uh, and we reduced the cumulative soil CO2 efflux. Future questions, and this is something I'd like the audience to consider uh, adding to my list here uh, with your management questions of interest. Uh, but future things that we're interested in studying at Rain Man are, uh, will the deeper rooted plants be more drought resistant? So once they've been conditioned like this and a, and a plot has received fewer larger uh, rainfalls, would that make it uh, more resistant to different types of drought in the future? Uh, are plots with a few large perennials and minimal cover from annuals more erosion prone? Uh, and is the reduced soil CO2 release, uh, presumably that means more soil carbon and litter are accumulating that aren't being decomposed. Will that eventually uh, be compensated at some future time, such as the next winter? We have a student, Jacob Lace, uh, working on that right now. And then uh, what are the additional effects of regionally declining winter rainfall? Uh, that's the current experiment that we've been uh, introducing to Rain Man over the last year. Um, I think I do have some results initially from the winter rainfall, but I think in respecting uh, Arthur's time, I will leave it there and pass it over. Thank you, Joel. We appreciate that. Um, for all the participants uh, in this webinar today, we encourage you to take a moment and write some questions into the chat as Martha starts sharing her screen. And, and Martha, whenever you're ready, feel free to get one. Awesome. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Joel. That was a great presentation, super interesting. Um, and thank you, Ariel and Cart, for the invitation to participate in this webinar today. Um, I am here to present on, um, or first, my name is Martha Sample, as Ariel mentioned, and I work at the Center for Adaptable Western Landscapes at Northern Arizona University here in Flagstaff. Um, but I'm here today to talk to you specifically about a project that I've been working on with a bunch of collaborators um, at uh, USGS Southwest Biological Science Center here in Flagstaff, the Park Service, and the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science specifically. Um, one of whom is here today. Hi, Molly. <laughs> um, and so this group has been working on an effort to develop a suite of adaptation strategies and approaches for managing arid grasslands in changing climate conditions over the course of the past few years. And also over the course of those past few years, a couple of affiliations have changed. So Molly, for example, who's here was affiliated with USGS at the time. She's since moved over to NAU, um, but she's a big part in this. Um, and then John Bradford has been kind of the, the project leader and PI at USGS, but a big collaborative effort with lots of folks. So I wanna make sure they're acknowledged. All right, so this effort, oh, excuse me, I just lost my screen. This effort grew out of a larger project that began in 2018, quite a while ago, pre-pandemic uh, at USGS, where John Bradford and Molly um, led a collaborative process with the Southeast Utah Group of Parks um, in, up in Utah <laughs> to identify research needs for climate adaptation planning. And the group decided to focus on grasslands specifically because of their ecological importance, um, the pressures that they're facing from ongoing drought and the um, availability of existing research products, many of which were from, from USGS. 
um, that were available to um, provide a foundation for their project. So this work spanned multiple years and involved many meetings and workshops, um, which are shown in some photos here on this slide. Um, all of those with managers and researchers working together um, to co-produce this knowledge and research agenda um, from both the NPS side and USGS side. So the final uh, written product, at least of this effort, was um, the recently published report from Bradford et al. on exposure and sensitivity of perennial grasses in the Sioux parks. And this came out in 2022 and is available online for anyone who is interested and hasn't yet seen it. It's very, very long and has a lot of cool, it's very dense with information, has a lot of cool maps and figures and modeling results. Um, some key takeaways from that report that are relevant to my presentation today are just kind of general modeling of, of future climate related impacts on the arid gra uh, grasslands. And remember here specifically, this was done um, for those Southeast Utah group of parks, which is Arches, Canyonlands, Heaven Weep, and Natural Bridges National Monuments. So um, some things similar to what Joel was just describing, a couple a little bit different, maybe with regards to precipitation, but in general, um, looking at hotter temps, greater temperature increases during those cool times of year. Um, actually for the Sioux Parks, modest, potential modest annual precipitation increase, um, but also a shift toward cool season precipitation with some consequences for soil moisture, so longer and hotter summers, um, dry soil periods, um, and then slightly higher moisture in uh, the winter season. And then that feeding into some vegetation and grass sensitivity responses, like increasing vegetation growth activity in the winter, drought stress in summer, and then changes in viability of perennial grasses overall, but also distinguishing between C3 and C4 grasses there. So again, this is like, there's many, many pages of cool info if you're, if you're wanting to dig in. Um, and also I'm probably not as qualified to talk about that as, as uh, John or Molly, but it's cool stuff. So where my role kind of begins um, is when NAU became involved with this team, um, a couple years later after the project had started, the team decided they wanted some additional capacity to help translate the larger climate adaptation goals of um, the science management team and, um, and these technical results that were produced as part of John's modeling effort into um, targeted management actions that could be undertaken by managers in these park units. So, I had some previous experience working on a similar project related to climate adaptation and fire management in the Southwest uh, through a collaboration with um, the Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science, which is out of um, the Forest Service uh, Northern Research Station in um, upper, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, actually, interestingly. Um, and so based on that experience and my sharing of how that went and the outcomes with John and, and Molly and the crew, we decided to apply the same climate adaptation framework, which is called the climate change response framework to this Sioux pro uh, project as well. Um, and that this framework is described extensively in the this general technical report from the Forest Service that I've cited here, which I highly recommend if you're interested and not familiar. Um, and I pulled a quote here from that GTR because I feel like it really summarizes the essence of the framework and that mirrors very closely what our goal was for this phase of the SUB project, which is um, to provide a collection of resources designed to help managers incorporate climate change considerations into management and devise adaptation tactics that they can actually carry out on the ground. So essentially translating broad concepts about climate adaptation into very targeted um, tangible actions. So to do this, the climate change response framework outlines a detailed process to guide managers through the steps of managing for climate adaptation as part of what they call the adaptation workbook. This figure shows that process, which is very similar to other climate adaptation framework cycles that you have likely seen. Um, so it has users defining their goals and considering climate impacts at the beginning. Um, and then 
uh, and using the best available knowledge and science and resources during that second step, and then working to identify adaptation actions and monitoring to evaluate success. Um, what's a little bit different here than other frameworks that this may look familiar to is the input bubble here that I've outlined in red in step four, where you identify actions. And what the adaptation workbook does and the, the climate change response framework does is uses prepared, pre-prepared compilations of adaptation strategies and approaches called menus so that users aren't necessarily just like asked to come up with something from scratch, from zero to start with nothing. So um, that's kind of the, the added value of this framework as far as I see it. So um, what is a climate adaptation menu? Um, essentially, it is a collection of plausible adaptation actions that allows users to explore actions that are most relevant for their location, um, project, context. And in this original um, 2016 report from NIACS, the, their team put together a menu, which I'm showing here on the right, of 10 adaptation strategies, each with nested approaches, which in their case focused on the forests of the upper Midwest and Northeast, which is their home environment ecosystem there. Um, so these are presented as a menu. Uh, they're meant to be adjusted and refined depending on specific objectives and locations of the user at the time that they're using it. So much like a restaurant menu, the idea is that managers can select actions best suited to their situation while simply not choosing what they're not interested in, which doesn't mean it's not a good idea for somebody else. It just means it's not appropriate or the, the most appropriate thing for them at that time. Um, similarly, you may not necessarily want to pick everything off the menu or certain combinations of things off the menu because they just wouldn't make sense or wouldn't go well together. Um, you really want to use the menu to pick and choose strategies and approaches that make the most sense for meeting your goals and objectives that you're bringing to this process at the time that apply to your specific circumstance. Um, so in this way, menus, unlike a set of um, uh, best practices or management recommendations, they're meant to be flexible, but not prescriptive. And in that way, accommodate diverse management goals and site conditions um, and allow users to decide what they need. Okay. So um, I'm gonna skip over this a little bit because of time, but basically this is just showing the adaptation menu structure that kind of tries to link concepts like big adaptation concepts like resistance, resilience, transition, or RAD, resist, accept, direct, down through this kind of hierarchical approach from strategy to approach to tactics, which are provided as examples in the menu, which are really these like prescriptive actions designed for the specific project and might vary a lot project to project, even within the same approach or strategy. I'm also gonna kind of skip over this slide, but this is showing um, just that this is a vetted process that has been used for a bunch of different sub-disciplines and groups. Um, there are a bunch of different published menus since that original 2016 version um, with very different kind of geographical or community-based um, fo foci, <laughs> I guess is the plural of focus. And then there's others that are in preparation um, that are being developed right now, including ours. And um, also interestingly, one, another grassland based menu, but for the Great Plains. So um, the earlier phases, as I mentioned at the beginning, the earlier phases of the SUG climate adaptation process, and the modeling that John did had already generated some really great resources that could be used in these first few steps of the process. Um, to assess those site-specific climate impacts, um, very site-specific information and modeling that John did, along with general um, lit review and an annotated bibliography that we developed. So to be able to complete this workbook cycle with um, participants, we needed to create our own menu of adaptation strategies and approaches specific to arid grasslands. So that is what we set out to do in this phase of the project. So we began by using the existing suite of NIACS menus as templates, both for conceptual purposes and just for structure. We created our own set of six strategies and nested approaches that we felt addressed key ecological values and principles of these systems, as well as climate impacts and management challenges and opportunities. We made sure that we also ensured that priorities that had emerged from the prior work of um, the SUG 
Park Service USGS group were adequately represented in our outline and then did a lot of iterative revision and reviews, um, both with our core team and the gracious folks at NIAX who partnered with us um, to support development of this menu. Um, the next step after we had a good working outline was to organize a workshop. Um, so we had a virtual workshop with our SUG uh, manager partners and also extended invites to managers from other park units across the Colorado Plateau, just to kind of extend our geographic scope. Um, at this workshop, we asked each park to pick a specific management project that they were working on and work through the steps of the adaptation workbook um, using the modeling from um, the USGS report and then using our draft menu in that fourth step to identify possible management options. Um, and so in addition to participants learning more about the results of the report and considering possible climate adaptation options, we were able to get really valuable feedback from them about the menu and incorporate suggestions into our next draft. And so that brings us <laughs> to this is our current, I know this is like breaking all the rules of text on slides, but um, in order to kind of condense this together, this is how it is. This is our current outline of just those strategies. So the red is like the highest hier hierarchical level of our um, menu here. So we have six strategies for arid grassland climate adaptation, and then nested within that three or four approaches or more, slightly more specific ways of implementing those strategies um, that are kind of nested in. And so this is our current working outline. What we have been working on um, rather slowly is developing a manuscript that fleshes out kind of the rationale behind each strategy and each approach and provides um, supporting support from the literature for each of these for, for justification for inclusion and for examples of how these have been used um, in arid grassland regions. And so we're currently working on that, hoping to submit um, sometime in the next few months for publication just so that this can get out there and be used by more folks. It's currently being used just in this format or in our draft manuscript format for some of these workshop, um, you know, people working through the adaptation workbook process, it's available for that. But um, yeah, I know time is time is short, so I won't read through this to you. I'll, I'll let you kind of um, process yourself and I'm happy to share this outline with anybody who's interested. Um, but yeah, and I'm happy to pop back to the slide if people have more questions, but for now, I'll just say thanks and um, looking forward to some discussion. Thank you, Martha, and thank you, Joel. A round of applause, both real and virtual um, for both of you. Thank you so much for presenting this work um, and, and in such a short timeline, uh, we have a number of questions that came in from presenters, uh, from participants rather, uh, and we have about 12 minutes. We'll see how many of those we can get through. And I want to remind folks that we will be continuing these conversations in the future, both in the Mesquite workshop and in future um, Grassland Community of Practice webinars, uh, where we invite y'all to participate and continue asking great questions and um, yeah, keeping this conversation moving forward about how we're managing grasslands in the Southwest, considering these climate trends to be more resilient into the future and meet the objectives that we have for these ecosystems. Um, so just jump into these questions. Uh, Tim asked a question for Joel about uh, invasive species and if you're clearing any invasives. And let me read the question as written. Are you clearing any invasives and are you following any invasives as part of an experimental group? Buffalo grass and cheat grass of particular interest. So we don't have any buffalo grass or cheat grass. And interestingly, we don't have any layman's love grass appearing in any of these plots. That's what we would most expect. Um, we partially selected this site because there wasn't much layman's around. We had mostly Arizona cotton top, and that was a species a lot of our stakeholders said they were interested to know would it thrive and survive under this future climate. Um, we did consider transplanting in layman's to do a, a layman's love grass. That's our main uh, invasive here comparison. Um, but most of the ecologists told me uh, you're you're much less likely to see a difference because functionally it's so similar um, to cotton top. You might you might see a difference if you ran the experiment ten years in community shift, 
but if you want to look at functional group responses, um, we, we, we had decided to keep it simple to one ecosystem and focus more on different levels of uh, rainfall manipulation. Thanks, Joel. Tim, did that answer your question? Do you have any follow-ups? That answered it. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, the next question was for Mar from Brecken. Um, Brecken says that uh, she used to work with the Climate Change Response Program with the National Park Service and wondered if you're still working with them to build out the menus. Sorry, if you don't mind me jumping in, Ariel. So that was from Martha, which I still would love an answer to, but I did have a question for Joel as well. Um, so I used to work with Sagebrush for a lot of years. I was really interested in your talk, um, just given some of those similarities. And something that I've wondered for a while is if deeper rooted plants tend to be more drought resistant. I know you had that listed as a future question. Is that something that y'all plan to study um, or is it just sort of a question floating in the abyss at the moment? I'm sure you are pretty busy. Oh, Joel, I think oh, you're on mute. mute. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you for asking that question. It's actually something that uh, my colleague Nathan Pierce is working on right now. He's got a paper in prep, and I'm going to preview one figure that I think will address your your question. And I think the answer is yes to the question: Do the larger rainfalls condition the plants to be more drought resistant? Um, what we're looking at here, I sort of made this slide well, well in the last, when I saw your question, so I, I forgot to put in uh, date labels, but this is basically every time we sampled community uh, percent cover over the last three years. And so um, where this blue dashed line is, we started introducing a uh, winter drought. So this panel on the left got only a fifth percentile uh, rainfall amount during the winter of 2021, 2022. Mm -hmm. And you see a trajectory after that where the S4 plots, the ones that had been conditioned with fewer larger rainfalls, mm -hmm. they actually continued to thrive. Uh, even under a fifth percentile winter, they still maintain 25% wow. plot cover. And the other ones, uh, the S1s declined. So these are all getting dry winter, but the summer rainfall that they had the previous several summers made a big difference in their trajectory. That held up with an average winter, but it, but it didn't matter as much. If we gave them all a wet winter, then it didn't matter at all. Yeah. So I, I think the answer is yes. Yeah, that's that's really, really neat. Yeah, thanks for sharing this. Thanks for the question. Um, we had another question for Joel from Jack Haley and Liam, uh, wondering if there's any indication that the large infrequent rain or small frequent rain models might increase or decrease fire severity across the region, especially as plants experience periods of drought? I don't have any way to address that quantitatively, but I will say from doing a lot of these cover surveys that the few large rainfalls, what we tend to get by the end of, of one summer even, but especially by the end of two or three summers, is a few large bunch grasses and maybe a burrow weed in a plot and a lot of bare soil because that's, that surface soil is dry so much of the time that all the shallow root annuals have perished. And after a couple of years, the seed bank is depleted. Um, and so those, those plots have thriving, but few uh, low cover, but, but relatively well watered uh, plants. Those wouldn't seem to me like they'd be less likely to carry a severe fire. Um, the many small rainfall events, we get a lot of early germination, two, three weeks of green, and then it's brown and there's, the plot is covered with standing litter by the end of July when there's still lightning season. So this is all speculation. It's not my area of, of expertise, but I would say fewer larger rainfalls to me in our, in our plots look like they would decrease fire risk after a few summers. Thank you, uh, that answers our question. And I see that Martha, you answered the question in the chat uh, that we had uh, that we had asked previously. Thank you for for answering that as well. Yeah, thank you, Martha. And Renee asks if there's a, a holistic approach to these areas that includes livestock grazing. 
and considering the evolution between these grasses and grazers and saliva. And Renee, I think that question was for, I'm, I'm not sure if it was for one presenter or the other, but I think that thinking about livestock and uh, grazing and climate adaptation here could definitely be a generative uh, question for, for either, either presenter. I can add, um, I don't know, I don't know about evolution between grasses and saliva necessarily. I know that there are people who do cool stuff at that. Um, I'm not one of them, but um, we, uh, you may have noticed <clears throat> in that outline I, I put up, we've um, made a decision to not specifically address grazing in our menu, uh, mostly because it was developed in conjunction with park units um, where uh, there is no grazing. Um, and so it's kind of a, and we had a, we've had a lot of discussions about like how to address that in our manuscript, addresses it in the discussion and basically says like, this is kind of beyond the scope of what we set out to do for this project, but it is important. And I think that that is um, probably fodder for an additional like addendum or something, a little uh, additional set of a couple of strategies or something for this menu. I'm not sure if it's a whole different menu, there is, I think, a point at which there are too many menus. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was something that we had a lot of conversations about and is definitely, you know, going to be a, <clears throat> a big part of um, <clears throat> adaptation in arid grasslands globally, because it's grazing is, is a huge activity in arid grasslands globally. But it is um, something that we um, just had to leave out of this specific effort due to the scope of our work with the original project. Thank you. And there was a clarification that it was salvia, not saliva. That was, uh, that was written there in the, in the chat. That was my mistake, my, my slight dys dyslexia there. Thank you for clarifying, Tim. Um, yeah, and now we have a, a couple questions I'd like in the last couple of minutes to, um, to turn the tables and ask the participants some questions from the, from the presenters. I know that Joel you had a, a question about um, including some feedback into future research, and uh, if you if you want to go for, go for it and post that question to the group. Uh, actually, several of the questions have already seeded some ideas there. Specifically, the follow up about the deeper rooted plants being conditioned, which I hadn't I hadn't looked at the figure that I showed in that way until Brecken asked that question. Um, but I guess the other would be we're doing relatively basic research here. And we have the idea that our results will somehow help improve uh, tools. And we're actually working with remote sensing people. So we're not being too vague about that. We're, we're looking at things like NDVI and EVI and thermal imagery um, to see which ones can, can most uh, well represent the ecosystem responses and productivity and things that we're interested in. But I think a question I have for the audience, and, and people are welcome to, to email me as follow-up, um, would be what tools are you using? We are not trying to add a tool to the toolbox. We're trying to do underlying research to address weaknesses that we know of in ecosystem models, modus products, Landsat products. Um, but if we know what tools you're using and can think about how a uh, changing frequency of an amount of precipitation uh, would be likely to, to make a response you're interested in, we might be able to tailor both experiments that we do in the future at the facility um, and the types of papers that we write and where we submit them so that they're most likely to have the desired impact. So for anyone who's on the call here still, um, feel free to either unmute and or just use the chat to say what tools y'all are using that some of Joel's research could help uh, inform and improve. I know that from previous conversations, folks use um, the rangeland analysis platform and the suite of products that came out of that, uh, those tools, um, and also grass cast and fuel cast are things that folks are using here. Um, and we've had the feedback that those products are all less effective in these as, as we all know, in these arid regions. And could, I think that those are a great place to start. Um, yeah, does anybody else have any other 
uh, remote sensing tools or decision support tools that they're using to make decisions in the grasslands we're managing or stewarding here. Feel free to keep putting those into the chat as we go along. Um, and then Martha, did you want to uh, ask a question as well to the, to the participants? Sure. Um, I guess I'm just wondering kind of as we work on getting this manuscript out and kind of disseminating this information and, and hoping to get it out and being used um, by managers, <clears throat> just wondering, I can throw this outline back up on the shared screen, but if anyone has initial thoughts on like, wow, something other than grazing, <laughs> something big is missing here, um, or you know, this looks pretty comprehensive or just any feedback um, on our menu as it sits or any interest from people in engaging more in this process as we kind of work on um, doing some more workshops or um, Ariel and I are gonna talk about that a little later, I think too, of like potential um, synergies and collaborations, but yeah, just any kind of initial feedback or thoughts on um, potential um, value or use of what we're producing here. I'll jump in, um, Bre Brecken again. I, I am super enthused to see the work that um, y'all have been doing. I've been peripherally you know, involved with NIAX and whatnot just from my time with C the Climate Change Response Program. And, <clears throat> sorry, uh, it, I had no idea how much your menus have exploded just since uh, a couple of years ago when I was uh, just starting to get involved. So it is really, really exciting to see that they are not only available, but coming to even, even more are coming to be available. So I guess I just wanted to say that I would be, I work in the climate change adaptation realm now. So I'd be very interested in just, I guess, being kept in the loop in terms of more progress that's going on. And if you hold any workshops, anything like that. Uh, even just earlier today, I was on a call with someone who was asking about adaptation strategies for some of the things that they were doing. And I was like, let me get back to you. And I was planning on pulling up y'all's website. And <laughs> then, so it was funny hopping on this call and being like, oh, hey, someone's already talking about it. So anyway, yeah, I'm really excited to see where this is headed. Awesome, yeah, <laughs> thanks. And I've got your info and I will definitely reach out. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I ha I'm happy to drop my email in chat if that's easier too. Yeah, I did that have would a be quick, great. Perfect. I did have a quick question. Do you have a general ETA on when you're hoping to get some of those future menus published? Um, I don't know because I'm not. I you know I'm not a NIAX person. I'm just mm -hmm. a collaborator on this particular project. So um, the main person that we work at, we work with at NIAX um, for this, and then who worked with me on the fire menu is Courtney Peterson. Okay. Who okay. Um, is at housed at CSU actually in Fort Collins, but she would be the the person to get in touch with, and I can put her email in the chat too. Perfect. That would be great. Thanks so much. Yeah. Hi. I'm just gonna jump in if that's okay. Um, hi, Martha. <laughs> um, uh, for others on the call, uh, my name is Colin. I'm a new postdoc who's working with Martha, Martha in the center. Um, so, but we haven't had a chance to talk about this. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask you a quick question. <laughs> sure. Um, this is uh, really interesting and I'm definitely gonna pick your brain about it later. <laughs> but, um, but one thing I was kind of looking at this and just kind of curious about is, um, especially in like number six, thinking about human communities, uh, obviously not all the details are here, but I was curious if in this process, you all considered sort of like, various dimensions of inclusion so like um i can imagine for any number of these bullet points there may be um you know based on seeds or whatever there might be gender or racial or age dimensions of like how these different um i mean even some sometimes how the um ecological concepts are even conceived right or which seeds are used or um even among people in different disciplines like what those climate impacts will be for you know farmers versus ranchers etc um, so I was just curious if that was a consideration that was incorporated into uh, this planning at all, or if it maybe is kind of an area for future thinking. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. I think a little bit of both, basically. Um, a lot of the earlier menus um, don't have any strategies or approaches related to human dimensions at all. And so 
Um, it's something we added in when I was working on the fire menu and we wanted to have at least, you know, make sure that that's not totally left out of this menu. It's definitely hard to balance because you could have, we discussed a lot when I was working on the fire menu, you could have a whole just like human dimensions menu, right? Like that could be a, its whole own thing and should be its whole own thing. Like that is a thing you can really dig into deeply. So we're trying to kind of find a balance with how to not exclude that uh, asp important aspect, but still have the focus for this menu be um, the ecological actions. I think the way that we've included it thus far is mostly with um, trying to incorporate tribal perspectives and consultation with tribes that um, inhabit and use and manage the land. But I think that, and, and we've been very intentional about that, but I think you make a great point that that's not, you know, the only group that um, is of that you know needs to be considered in this process, and I think um, that's definitely something that we should think about as we work on um, our our manuscript and draft, and before it you know gets out there in the world. So I appreciate that perspective. Thank you so much for the great questions, y'all. Um, just looking at the time, two o six. We have time for maybe one more uh, comment or question, and, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. All right. Well, thanks, y'all. If we missed any of the questions, we'll make sure to send those to presenters and follow up with those in the post webinar summary. Um, and we appreciate everybody taking the time to spend the last hour and, and five or six minutes with us. Thank you again to both the presenters. Um, a couple last minute reminders as we close this out that this webinar, the recording will be posted to our YouTube channel and to the Grassland Community of Practice playlist. Uh, Carly just put both of those links in the chat uh, where y'all can see other webinars that CART has um, has produced over the over the years and all of the webinars that we've produced through the grassland community of practice. Um, we're also continuing to line up webinar speakers for for the coming months. If y'all have any speakers you would like to hear from, projects you would like to learn about, or subjects that you would like us to address in these webinars, please get in touch with me um, and let let us know so that we can make sure that we're addressing the needs that y'all have. Um, and one last time, thanks everybody for your for your participation and your continued engagement in the grassland community of practice. And um, we hope that everybody has a nice day. Bye all. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you.